Hey guys, Sean C. Phillips here. Welcome to my January 25th DVD update. Where I talk about all the DVDs and Blu-rays I've gotten over the last two weeks or so. And like I always say, if you enjoy these DVD Blu-ray updates, definitely give this video a thumbs up. Leave me comments below. Let me know about what you thought of the titles that I checked out and any future titles to check out. Now the first one I got from Shout Factory Scream Factory line is the Night of the Demons Blu-ray, which I absolutely love this new cover that they had done. I just saw the cover recently for the upcoming Sleepaway Camp release, which looks great. This is one that I've always really liked. Um, you know, it's the first time this has ever come to Blu-ray. This is a movie about, it. Um, you know, on Halloween night, a group of these friends all get together to, you know, have a party at this old abandoned funeral home where pretty much bad things have happened. And they end up coming up with the idea of having this seance. And by doing that, they end up awakening these evil spirits, which ends up possessing one of the girls. And it kind of leads to other possessions and really weird, crazy things happening to them. Great practical effects on them of, you know, when they turn into the demons. You know, they did a remake of this, and I thought they went kind of overboard with, with the, you know, the possession demon makeup in, the, in, that, in that one. This one was way cooler. You know, the other one, they didn't, apparently didn't even have the actors half the time because they didn't want to get in the makeup. They had stunt people in it. I know, I always really enjoyed this one. You know, Linnea Quigley is in this one. And the movie has a vibe of the first Return of the Living Dead film about, you know, like the kind of kids and some of the punk kids all getting together and parting and has that kind of a feel to it. Also love the opening song, you know, the theme song in this movie. Uh, this is just one that I would totally check out. Looks absolutely great on Blu-ray. Has a whole bunch of features on here. It has a, I think it's like an hour and 20 some minutes of, you know, interviews, like the, basically the whole making of the movie. And they, you know, they pretty much talk to most of the cast members and the director and, you know, go into the details about making the film. Um, it also has a whole bunch of pictures on here. Still gallery. One of the actresses shows her personal photos that she took on set. Um, as well as a commentary with the director and actors. This is one, though, I would really check out. You know, I definitely recommend. And if you like movies like Return of the Living Dead and those kind of films, you would definitely like this one. The next one I got from Scream Factory as well is Witchboard, which is actually Kevin Teeny, director of Night of the Demon's first ever movie. Um, this is one about these... These people at a party, there are like 20-somethings together for this party. The one guy ends up having a Ouija board there. It's the party of this um, couple, and, you know, the one girl used to be dating the one guy, and the other two used to be friends and kind of had a falling out. And, you know, he brings out this Ouija board, and he calls it like, eat weed. Ouija board, or however the way he's saying it, this is in a really unique way, and he's, you know, convinced that's how you say it. And he ends up, you know, he usually contacts this kid who's like 10 years old on the Ouija board, and when he's there doing it, the, um, the one's boyfriend, you know, doesn't get along with the guy, is kind of making jokes about it, and angering the spirit, and by doing that, the spirit gets really pissed off, and bad things end up happening because of it. Like the next day at his job, you know, this thing crushes the one guy. It's basically, Spirit is kind of taking a vengeance on him and it's also taking weird things are happening to the guy's girlfriend and she's starting to act strange. The guy with the Ouija board is pretty much possessed. You know, convinced that the girl is going to be, is getting possessed and it's using her and kind of making her vulnerable and then playing to possess her. And it's kind of them trying to figure out what's going on. I love the scene too when they bring in the, this woman who's kind of like this punk girl who's like the medium and trying to contact the spirit. She went on to play in a bunch of different movies, but she was on um, Getting Even With Dad as the mother in the beginning. And I think the voice of Pepper Ann, that, that was like my favorite part of the whole movie. I don't know, I really like this one. It had just a real cool vibe to it. Um, I don't know if this one I might have seen years back on like Up All Night, you know, USA Up All Night, or Joe Bob Briggs. It has that kind of vibe to it. I just really liked it. It also has, a, I think, like 45 minutes of interviews with a number of the cast members as well. Uh, a commentary track on here, and a bunch of vintage making of featurettes as well. I don't know, I like this one a lot. Definitely would check this out. Well, the next one from Sony is In a World, which is, you know, directed and written by Lake Bell, and she stars in it as well. Really like this one. It's basically about the world of trailer narrations. Lake Bell's character is, you know, she's a vocal coach and kind of, you know, speech coach, and her father is kind of best known for being kind of the second best trailer voice in the world. The original guy in Real Life 2, who they're talking about in the movie, passed away a couple of years back, who's the guy who was always like, in a world. And, you know, since then, too, the kind of 
there's been a lack of those kind of trailers, you know, and they talk about this in this movie as well, where there's that kind of a narration. It's kind of started to die off. And this movie, Lake Bell's character is um, basically up for this part, which is going to bring back the inner world. And it's just by a fluke that she ends up with the chance to do this. Because, you know, she always kind of wants to get into the world of, you know, doing narrations for movies and things like that. But her father, you know, is, like I said, the second best. And he's really kind of against the idea of anyone else in the family succeeding at anything but him. So she's not he's not very excited about anything or excited about her even trying, doesn't encourage her or anything like that. And it's this movie deals with two with um, you know, Rob Cordry's character you know, who because her father his you know, her father, Lake Bell's character in the movie's father is getting married to this younger woman. They want her to move out, so she has to move in with her sister and her you know, sister's husband is played by Rob Cordry and it's all their kind of problems and their kind of marriage issues going on. I just really found this to be a really fun movie, you know, and I and I like the idea too, you know, of them having a woman do a voice in the trailer because there hasn't been too many. And if you guys know any below like that had women, you know, doing voices in the trailers, I can always think of though Terminator 2. I know Linda Hamilton did the narrow narration. I don't know. I just would really recommend this movie. It's a really fun, just I just a really positive movie too. Uh, the next one from Lionsgate, and this is one I saw in theaters as well, um, is Instructions Not Included, and I, the, 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 um, the director is the same guy who stars in the film as well, and I always think of him from, I think that was one of his first like big American films that he did, was um, Jack and Jill. I know a lot of people didn't like it, but he was the guy who was dating Jill in the movie, and he was talking about chimichanga bombs and stuff. I, I just love this actor. Um, and it's basically a movie about, he's this guy in Mexico who kind of is sleeping around with all these different women, and he eventually ends up getting this American woman pregnant, um, you know, and she basically comes back, drops the baby off at the house, and leaves it, and he doesn't know what to do, and so he ends up trying to go to America and find the woman. And, you know, he doesn't have a passport or anything like that. So he ends up having to sneak over to America with the baby. When he gets over there, he can't get back. He, he knows that he's going to be trapped because he has no passport, no way to get back. And, you know, he, and he also has no, you know, worry about the baby. And he's kind of him when he gets there, all the issues that happen along the way of getting to America. And then when he gets there, there's a, the baby just about dies, you know, in the pool, he has to save her, and this guy ends up seeing him jump into the pool, this crazy thing off the roof of this building, and gets him a job as a stuntman, and it's him basically in America years later, I think like seven years later, uh, you know, being a stuntman, their life is going really well, but at the same time, his daughter is always wondering about his mother, about her mother, and it's kind of an awkward situation, because they have no idea where she is, and it's kind of about the task of trying to find the mother and you know what ends up happening if they do and things like that this is a to me was a really really heartfelt movie and i will say too i seriously cried at some of the aspects of this movie it was very very sad but a very very well done movie you know, even though it's, you know, you have to read it it's subtitled for the most part, like 90% of it, it's not one of those ones that I had a hard time following, really, really got into the story. I would just really highly recommend if you want to watch a really positive, really sweet story that kind of got overlooked by a large amount of people, I would definitely check this one out. Uh, the next one from Lionsgate as well, I actually just finished watching this one, and it's Collision. And this was an interesting movie because it was actually shot in Morocco. I'm pretty sure it was. And it had great settings. You know, it looked like it really did shoot out in the desert for pretty much all of it. And I love this hotel they went to at the beginning of the movie. It was out in the middle of the desert. There's absolutely nothing for, like, miles every single direction than this hotel in the middle of it. And it's this couple that are going to Morocco for their vacation and, you know, for their honeymoon and... The, there's something weird going on, like, the, they're kind of not getting along great, you know, and then you see the the wife end up going out into the hallway one, at one point and finding this guy making out with him and talking to him, and he, she's like, so we're going to go out tomorrow and this looking for these ruins or something like that, and you're going to follow us and, you know, you're going to do it. Basically, you know, the plan is to kill the husband, and there's something going on with her and this other guy. They end up, you know 
the next morning, the husband and the wife end up, you know, driving out in the middle of the desert. And, you know, he has the idea that he wants to go more of a scenic route. End up going this way, the, you know, that boyfriend who's, you know, out there to pretty much kill him, you know, notices because he has a tracking device that they went a different way, starts chasing after them. They end up in this terrible accident and crash in the middle of the desert. And it's they crash in this other car with these other people and it's like the survivors left. And it's basically about them all out in the middle of this desert trying to survive. And there's this one guy who's very questionable and you know that he's up to something going on. You see him kill the guy in the beginning. You know, no one sees it, only the audience sees it. Just something weird going on, uh, you know, about them trying to get back and it's just a whole awkward thing. I really enjoy it. By the end though, it has, it's one of those movies that kind of takes a bit of different twists and kind of gets just a tiny, tiny bit confusing at the end just because it has so many different aspects going on and it sort of seems like it would be over at one point when it wasn't. I don't know, I, I enjoy it though. I like the setting too. The setting really made it a different kind of movie. The next one from Disney is The Fifth Estate, which is the movie on the, the true story of the Wikilinks website, which is about like the founder and co-founder, you know, who started this website, which was basically about to divulge secrets for, you know, government secrets and all kinds of stuff, get like records and things like that and bring it to the public and kind of about them, you know, how they were getting these secrets and how they were, you know, bringing them forward and kind of all the issues and things like that that had happened by what they were doing. You know, it stars Benedict Cumberbatch, you know, who's recently, you know, in the new Star Trek film, been a whole ton of movies. He's a really, really good actor. I thought he did a good job in this movie. You know, the movie had a lot of really mixed attention. You know, if, if you like these kind of movies when it's kind of about discovering government secrets and kind of all the things going on, it's it's a little long, but it's, I thought it was an interesting movie. It has a bunch of different features on here, like featurettes about um, discovering the story, you know, how they got some of the secrets and things like that. I know, too, um, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch wanted to talk to the main guy, you know, who the story was based on, and they couldn't, you know, he didn't want to talk to him and things like that. Um, you know, too, I always remember, too, when the Wikilinks site was new and people were talking about it. I was, like, thinking they were talking about Wikipedia, because I never really looked into it at the time, so I had no idea what they were talking about. But it's an interesting movie about discovering secrets and you know, all these kind of things that they find out and kind of the, what ends up happening to them because of this and how they put the whole thing together. Uh, the next one from uh, Magnolia is Best Man Down. It's one I didn't know a whole ton about, but really love this one. Um, it's a different movie, too, than you would think. You know, it doesn't go the directions you would think. It has a lot more deep meanings to everything. And it's about um, Justin Long's character and his and his wife who just got had just gotten married. They're out in the middle of the desert for this kind of like, um, I think they called it like location weddings or something like that, destination weddings. And they're there with their, you know, the best man. He's, you know, they are pretty much getting drunk and causing pretty much a scene. And the night, you know, of the wedding, you know, at night when he goes back to his room, he's in his room screwing around when he's extremely drunk ends up knocking his head on the back of the floor, or in the back of, a, of the, the desk by the bed, ends up bleeding everywhere, wandering out in the desert and dying. And it's about, you know, Justin Long and his, and his wife uh, having to deal with this now because they can't go on their honeymoon. They have to deal with getting the body back. And it's this whole thing of getting the body back and they have the way they have to send it and getting back to Minnesota to, you know, work the the funeral arrangements. And it also deals with this one character who's this young girl who you don't really know who who she is. You know, you're seeing her a lot throughout the movie. You eventually do find out, you know, her character. But it's basically you just sort of see her, find out some about her who's like, you know, with her mother and her mother's got all kinds of problems and her, the boy her mother's boyfriend's like this drug addict and you're just kind of seeing their character and, you know, dressed along and his wife's character getting back, and his wife is played by the actress who was in uh, the movie Teeth, which I really liked. But it's basically, though, them getting there and dealing with this stuff and, you know, putting together, you know, the the pieces to things, too, because the best man, like, you know, they kind of thought they knew this guy, but there's all these different things going on when they get there. You know, he doesn't work where he, where he says he does, and there's kind of all these things coming together, and really has a great ending too. I, I just would recommend this one. Just a really well put together movie. With, it's Like I said too, it takes a lot of different directions than you would think. 
Uh, the next one from Cinnadime, and this one is, you know, got a number of awards and, you know, stars Brie Lawson and John Gallagher Jr. And it's uh, Short Term 12, which is a really pretty good one. And it's about, um, you know, Brie, Brie um, Lawson's character and her boyfriend work at this kind of a group home, kind of a foster program for kids and they're the kind of kids who are a little bit older and have a really hard time getting placement and they're kind of have been in and out of foster care and they're really only at this place for a year or two and it's about them kind of you know working at this place and kind of the the kind of people that they meet the one guy who's at the foster program is going to be getting out in a year in a no in a couple weeks because he's just turning 18 and deals with he, he was one of my favorite characters in the movie and it's kind of him dealing with the fact that he's going to be out and it's very emotional because he's going to be on his own and he's not that's the thing that's really sad about people who are in programs like this when they get out trying to manage on their own you know and dealing with it um but you know uh Brie Lawson's character and her, you know, boyfriend kind of having their own issues going on. And she has a lot of baggage from the past and kind of commitment issues because he really wants to get married to her. And she has all these kind of reasons why and kind of bad things have happened to her in the past. I just like this movie. There's some really kind of, you know, s sweet, fun parts of this movie as well with them, with the kids and, um, you know, just sort of taking care of them and all the kind of quirks of the kids and the kind of problems and things like that. Uh, the movie also has the original short which the movie was based on. Uh, behind the scenes featurette, making of I don't know, I, I like this one a lot. And the next one from Millennium from their hammer line is uh, Frankenstein Created Woman which actually comes with these cool lobby cards from the movie. Uh, this is one though that I had never seen before one of the Hammer films. I would have to say though this is one of my top ones that I've seen. Now I'm going to say though it's really 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 hard to talk about this movie and get into any aspects of this movie without ruining things. So because it's one of those movies where you know you kind of know everything that happens by the title and you know by by reading about it so I don't I just don't want to say too much about it. I just want to say that it's you know Peter Cushing's character is doing these experiments in this movie with the scene where he basically dies and sees how long after, you know, he can be brought back and the soul stays in his body after he's been dead and he's creating this machine where he can kind of hold the soul of somebody who's died and, you know, plan what he says, these plans of what to do with it. And it's about, you know, his assistant and his girlfriend who works in this kind of uh, pub, kind of restaurant place and it's basically something ends up happening to the boyfriend and it, because of these these terrible like hoodlum guys that are you know working they kind of remind me of early versions of the Clockworth Orange guys who work at you know who come into this this bar and what ends up happening to the boyfriend because of what these guys done and that's pretty much all I can say I don't, I don't want to ruin anything but you know you know from the title that he ends up creating woman um, I, you know, I know it's going to be so old, and it's after a while. It's like, what can you say? You know, is it a spoiler? But I, I don't want to, I don't want people to be like, you spoiled it. So I'm not going to spoil it. But I'm just going to say, I absolutely love this one. Um, you know, it has a commentary on here, and it also has a uh, new documentary talking about the you know the women of the Hammer horror films, which is a really well done. Like, I think it's about an hour long, I believe. Um, I would definitely check this one out. Check out the trailer for this one online. Uh, I don't know how much it shows. Like I said, I just don't want to tell too much. The next one from Image is the brand new Blu-ray release of Never Sleep Again, the two-disc version. It has a bunch of different new features on it as well. Um, I never had the original release. I actually had never seen this one before. Um, had always wanted to check it out. And it's a documentary that basically looks at all the Nightmare on Elm Street films, kind of like what they did with um, the Jason documentary recently and the Return of the Dead documentary. And it basically goes through all of the different films and talks to the directors, talks to the actors, and it's about pretty much the making of the films, you know, the origin of the whole story of Nightmare on Elm Street. I always love these ones. It's pretty long. I think it's like I think it's about four hours long, so it really gets into detail. Has a the, I think what a new feature on here is the horrors, horrors hollowed ground feature with Sean uh, Clark, you know, going to the locations of the um, Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, I don't know. I, I thought this was a really well done documentary. And if you love this kind of stuff, that go into details and they're great companion pieces to the Blu-ray releases, you know, because it's 
because they didn't have a whole lot of features, you know, getting into these kind of details. I would highly check this, definitely check this one out. And the next one from Ketchup Entertainment is The Starving Games, which is the spoof movie of The Hunger Games. There's also that spoof coming out called the the Hangover Games or the Hungover Games coming out, which is like the characters from the Hangover movie put into the the world of the Hunger Games. You know, this is from the guys that did Date Movie and Epic Movie, and I I actually thought Epic Movie was okay because I liked Crispin Glover in it playing Willy Wonka. That was the main thing, and I and I liked the cast of it. This one though is a smaller budgeted one, so they don't really have the um, you know the celebrity cameos in this one like they did in the other ones. You know they have Dedrick Bader you know from Rex Quando you know Rex Quando character in uh, Napoleon Dynamite and Off of Space and a number of different movies, and he plays kind of the Donald Sutherland part of the movie. And they did a pretty decent job with the casting of the actress to play the Jennifer Lawrence's character. It's essentially, though, just them kind of her put into the world and kind of just riffing on the movie. And they kind of show certain aspects of, like, what you got stung by those bees. and They kind of show certain aspects of it. Um, this wasn't absolutely funny to me. You know, there was some kind of humorous parts to it. Um... You know, I didn't really, like, absolutely like, hate it or anything like that. I, th I thought that it was a easy watch. I thought it was kind of kind of just sort of silly. I always like these kind of spoof movies. I think, though, they could have done a little bit better with it. And I think if they had a little bit more money, because it didn't come to theaters, I think it had, like, a really limited release. Because I think it was just because it was, it was just a smaller movie it would have been hard to promote. Uh, the next one from Anchor Bay is Sorority Party Massacre, which is, you know, I love the title because it's kind of a throwback to the Slumber Party, Sorority Party, Ma Party House Massacre movies. And it's, essentially it starts off with this girl in the beginning of the movie talking to her father. She's out in the middle of nowhere trying to find this house for this kind of sorority meetup where they're having these kind of games, you know, competition to see who wins the, it's kind of, Von Skin Games, so it was a weird name they were calling it, but she ends up getting killed at the beginning, and her father ends up sending one of the cops, you know, in L.A., because this is out in the, you know, I think the northern part of California, and, you know, it's Kevin Sorbo plays her father, and sends this kind of cop who's getting pretty much, you know, put on suspension because he's really, his tactics, and cr he's crazy, and, you know, beats people up, and kind of, you know, he's basically just being suspended, so he ends up saying, well, you know, if will you give my, you know, lower the amount of time that I'm suspended if I go and, you know, go up there and try and find your daughter who hasn't returned your calls and things like that. So it's basically him going up to this town to look for the, for the daughter. And when they get there, you know, it's, you know, finding the sorority house. And it's uh, Leslie Eastwick, who's like the kind of sorority mother who's the head of these games, these fond skin games. And I think, I don't know exactly what they're, they're trying to win, like the heads, for, I think it's like a scholarship. I liked it though, because there's some really cool throwback style deaths in this movie. It was also one of those movies too, when you were kind of guessing who was the killer, because they would kind of hint at all these different people. And it also has a lot of different twists and more, you know, different things happen than you're expecting. I really like, though, the sheriff of the town. He's, you know, been in a ton of movies and was also in, you know, Six Feet Under. Um, I think he was Ruth's, no, the one mother in Six Feet Under, she was dating him for a while. I, I don't, I had a fun time with this. Like I said, it's a real throwback. Got a bunch of different cameos in it. Ron Jeremy's in the movie for two different scenes. I like this one. If you like, you know, classic slasher horror and you want to see like a fun throwback kind of vibe horror films, I would check this out. The next one from MPI is, um... The next one from MPI is A Dark Touch, which is a really interesting movie that really, you know, goes in some pretty, like, really different directions that you don't see many too, many too many movies go. Kind of hints at a lot of different things as well. It was pretty, pretty well done. It's about this girl who, um, something's weird going on around her in this house, and things are happening in the house, and things are moving, and, um, her, basically, her parents end up but basically attacked by the house. They get, the, the one gets sort of crushed, and the one, basically they get totally destroyed and killed by this house. And the girl ends up, you know, when they're trying to find a new home for her, ends up moving in with the, the neighbors who were best friends with the, her parents. 
And when she gets to this house, things are still going on. Things are still starting to move, and things are still starting to happen. And that's essentially what it is, is trying to, you know, deal with, figure out what is going on with this girl, and why this stuff is happening, and why people are dying off of these really weird, unexplainable deaths, and the, the cops trying to figure out what's going on, and looking at this girl, trying to figure out how could she have, have anything to do with this, but yet she's the only one who was there at all these different occurrences. Great, you know, you know what happens is just a really weird, you know, out there movie, um, you know, that deals, like I said, with a really dark, dark, terrible subject, you know, and I don't know, I, I, I like this one, but it really is... Uh, Kind of a different movie. Uh, the next one, and this one I actually believe Edgar Wright produced, and it's Sightseers. And I really had a fun time with this. It's about this couple who are in their 40s who, you know, pretty much have never really had much, you know, luck with relationships and things like that. And they end up going on this kind of, um, you know, they take a RV, and it's basically them going across the country having this kind of love fest of them pretty much just having sex in this RV everywhere they go. And that's pretty much their, their plan for this trip. And basically when they're at this one of this RV park, the um, one guy ends up killing somebody. And the girlfriend finds out about it and doesn't seem to care at all. And kind of likes it. And it's kind of them on this sort of killing spree as well. And very, very quirky, weird movie. You know, you can tell that, you know, that Edgar Wright produced it because it has that kind of quirky vibe that his films have. Um, definitely a different type of movie, too. I, don't, I really had a fun time with this one because it really is weird and all the things that they do and all these kind of attractions that they go to, why they're committing all this. I really, really had a fun time with this. I would definitely check this one out. Uh, the next one from uh, MPI as well. This one is very kind of confusing, and it's Barbarian Sound Studio. I really like the lead actor in this. He's been in tons of different movies. Was in the you know the Hitchcock movie, which was the TV one for HBO. You know he played Hitchcock in that one, not the theatrical one. And it's about him, who's this kind of sound designer who puts together sound designs and foley and things like that. That goes to this. Um, studio where they're working on the sound mix for this new horror movie where he's not allowed to see the movie they're not telling him any details about you know what the movie is about so he's just sort of working blind there and it's essentially about him you know wor working there with all these kind of weird things going on and it's you know a movie that's them you know set in the 70s doing a you know like a gallo film or giallo film you know those kind of films but essentially, he's almost like he's in his own kind of film, kind of the movie, like in the movie with him making, you know, putting together the sound is almost like the Giallo film. And it's just weird things are going on. And it takes a kind of a, a, a peculiar turn at the end. I was kind of confused with what was going on. It has some cool music in it, just a really cool setting and vibe and well acted movie. I really liked it. But like I said, it's not one of those movies where you can like really explain it and really explain exactly what's going on in it uh the next one from accelerator media is um Bam banshee chapter and no it's not a sequel to banshee the one i did was in years back it's his own its own movie but it's um about this kind of weird drug like i think it was in the 70s or 60s or 70s that the government was like trying out on people and when they would essentially see all these weird things and hear all these weird sounds and this guy is doing an experiment, and he obtains the drug, creates it, and, you know, he's filming with his friend, his friend is filming him, and, you know, weird things are happening in the video, the the guy ends up going missing, and the guy's um, girlfriend, you know, is trying to put the pieces together with the footage that she's seen, and try and find out where he is, go back to the town where, you know, the drug was created and try and figure out anything she can about this drug. Uh, Ted Levine is in it as this writer who, you know, Ted Levine who was in, you know, The Mangler and Signs of the Lambs, really, really liked his part in this movie. And it's just her trying to put together pieces of this drug. And I, the thing that's kind of funny is, like, when they 
take the drug, they end up hearing this music that kind of reminds me of like, you know, Ice Cream Man music or something. You know, like the Ice Cream Man, and he's like ringing the bell, coming. It's kind of like that music. That's what you hear. And then you see all these peculiar things. I, that's what I will say is the creepiest aspect of this movie is kind of the weird stuff that you see and that kind of flash at you. And there were some creepy aspects of the movie. Ted Levine, though, was really, really good. Always loved that guy. He also did the voice in um, Joyride. Um, I would check this out, though. It's a very creepy movie dealing with kind of drugs and, you know, ex governments, you know, the kind of weird drugs that the people say that they experiment on them and things like that. Uh, the next one from Mill Creek is the new release of Married with Children Season 1 and 2, which is which is pretty cool that the, I think it was like the next releases are going to, because these ones originally had the original theme song. The um, next releases, from what I've heard, are going to have the original theme song put back. Because on the original Sony releases that came out years back, I think starting at season three, they had to make that new song. It was just like... Doo -doo 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 I mean, it was better than nothing and better than not having the theme. But to me, this show, that music fits so well. And it's like one of those ones where you don't ever skip the opening. You like to hear that music and then it really puts you in the vibe of the show. But, you know, everybody pretty much knows Mary Children, the classic show with Al Bundy and his family, who's like the shoe salesman, and all their kind of quirky things that go on. Um, you know, one of my favorite episodes, too, of this show was when they were in the market. That was, you know, absolutely when they stayed and slept over in the market. I would, you know, if you guys don't have this set, it's a really great price. And like I said, too, the future seasons as well that had the music change, as far as I've heard, are going to have the original opening theme music. But definitely check this out. If you know, I'm sure pretty much everyone's seen Married with Children, but uh, just a great one. Now, the next one is um, I Cannibal. This is a very peculiar movie. I really, really, really liked it. It's from, um, you know, Kino's. Um, from the R R A O video line, uh, the movie's basically about though, like some kind of this weird futuristic, and I don't even know exactly when it's set, but the the they're basically everyone's getting shot, like all these different people are getting shot, left for dead on the streets, even kids in the beginning, and the government won't allow anybody to move these bodies, you know, just pretty much you have to leave them there, and this one girl whose brother was killed really doesn't like the idea of him being left there. So she wants to move his body, and she knows that she can't do it, and, you know, if she does, what's going to happen? She ends up meeting this guy who's kind of like Russell Brand, this guy who, like, kind of looks like, you know, Russell Brand. You know, but this was way before Russell Brand. I don't think he was even alive when this was made. But, like, he almost looks like he could be Russell Brand's father. And um, it's basically them together, and this guy doesn't speak like a weird, you know, recognizable language. It's them moving the bodies and what ends up happening to them, you know, by doing so and, you know, getting arrested. And it's just this weird, strange stuff. It has this really, really cool music that Eno Marcione did for the movie. It also has this really cool theme song. It's like, they call me a cannibal because I won't die. And it sounds like this true... Like, ge like general, like generic cowboy guy singing the song. Like a true cowboy. I don't know. It, and it doesn't, you know, it's kind of funny, like this cowboy guy singing the song, but I like that. I don't know. It's something weird. It's a really weird movie, but looks really good on Blu-ray, but just very, very, very out there and different. And, you know, you can see it's a movie that inspired a lot of directors and has a lot of those kind of great aspects. And I love to, I was kind of getting freaked out and worried a couple of times because the people would lie in the road dead and you'd see a car go by. And I'm like, oh, I hope they don't run them over or hit them. Because you could tell it was one of those movies that were done just sort of guerrilla style. Now, the last one from Kino is the classic silent film, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mrs. Hyde, which I thought they did a pretty decent job cleaning this one up. You know, it's, you know, from 1920, so it's like... You know, how good could it look? And for that old, it really did a pretty decent job cleaning it up. You know, it's a classic story, though, of, um, you know, Dr. Jekyll, who is creating this, this serum, who ends up, you know, taking it and ends up, you know, becoming Mr. Hyde, the crazy kind of murderer character. Um, my favorite story of Dr. Jekyll and Mrs. Hyde was always uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mrs. Hyde, which I think they did for HBO. Um, I don't know. I always absolutely love that one. Um... This one, though, has a number of the original Dr. Dracula and Mrs. Hyde, Mr. Hyde shorts as well. The one from 1912, 
uh, a parody version. It's just a fun, you know, classic silent film movie. Now, anyway, though, that's all for this DVD Blu-ray update, and I'll see you guys later. And thanks again for watching and subscribing, and I'll see you guys later. Bye.